Okay. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today. I'm really excited to um, present to you a project that I have developed and been working on over the last few years. Um, it's focused on the Bahamas swallow and endangered and endemic bird species. Um, so I just want to go ahead and say right off the bat that um, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is actually the, uh, are the questions that I'm asking and briefly um, the methods that I'm using to answer those questions. As much as I would like to show you results today, um, this project will involve analysis of large data sets over several field seasons, um, but I would be happy to speculate with you at the end over what I've found so far, either at the end of the presentation or throughout the conference. So please feel free to ask questions. Okay. So there are five endemic bird species in the Bahamas, and two of those species are listed on the IUCN red list as threatened. The Bahama Oriole as critically endangered, and the Bahama Swallow as endangered. Now, the project that I'm going to talk to you about today, um, which is the focus of my doctoral dissertation at Virginia Tech, uh, focuses on the Bahama swallow. The Bahama swallow is one of nine uh, species in the Tachycineta genus. The genus range extends all the way um, across the western hemisphere from Alaska down to the southern tip of Argentina. There's an organization run out of Cornell University uh, that studies the life history of this genus. Um, and they do this mainly by studying breeding Bahama swallows in nest boxes. Now, the Bahama swallow is the only one of the nine species that actually refuses to use nest boxes. And so the um, Bahama swallow is um, the least studied in the genus, and it's also the only endangered species in the genus. The Bahama swallow breeds on three islands in the northern Bahamas, and you've heard these referred to many times today because the, um, I'm going to refer to them as the Pine Islands in general because they're the only islands in the Bahamas that contain large tracts of Caribbean pine. So you have Grand Bahama, Great Abaco, and Andros. My work primarily is done on Great Abaco, although I do go over to Andros occasionally to um, extend the methods there, and hopefully I will be extending this into Grand Bahama eventually. Okay, um, so the Bahama swallow is, um, is a obligate secondary cavity nester. What that means is that it requires a cavity or a hole in an otherwise solid structure um, to build its nest, but it cannot create its own cavity. Instead, it requires other species to do that for it. In this case, it, re it requires the services of the hairy woodpecker and the West Indian woodpecker. Now, the West Indian woodpecker is only on Great Abaco, so as I'm discussing that species, you can exclude it when you're thinking about uh, Grand Bahama and um, Andros. The Bahama swallow is also an aerial insectivore, um, which if you could see these pictures behind here, um, what that means is that it, it forages, so it consumes only flying insects. And the way that it catches those is while it's flying in the air, it takes them right out of there. Um, so you can thank the Bahama swallow and the other aerial insectivores um, on the islands for attempting to keep those nasty biting insects under control. So the goal of this project is to um, provide, sorry, is to provide the necessary information to conserve and manage the Bahama swallow. It's an endangered species, it has um, a very small range, and it's endemic to the Bahamas. Now to do this, I'm going to focus on three main areas of research. The population biology, so focusing on the abundance, distribution, and dispersal of Bahama swallow populations. The life history, so the phenology, um, the reproductive success of the Bahama swallows. And in order to effectively conserve the species, first we need to figure out which um, factors in its environment may be contributing to population declines. And so I'm going to be investigating several agents of decline. So first we're going to dive into the population biology. So there are only three, um, there are only three estimates that are published of population um, abundance for the Bahama swallow. Okay, so in 1977, um, Emlyn 
did an assessment of all of the birds on Grand Bahama, and he estimated just under 20,000 birds. In 1989, Smith and Smith did another, another assessment and came up with an estimate of around 4,800 birds. So that's a pretty drastic difference, okay? In 1995, um, Allen did another survey and came up with an estimate that the Bahama swallow population had decreased by another 25%. Now, I'm going to give you the same advice that, um, that Paul Allen gave in his publication, which is that when you're thinking about these numbers, you need to use caution in directly comparing them because the uh, survey locations and techniques did differ between the studies. But regardless of the precision of the estimates, it's pretty clear that there's been a drastic decrease in the populations. Also, I'd like to point out that the most recent survey was conducted in 1995, um, which was 20 years ago. Now, the, well, 21 years ago, to be more precise. Um, and the current estimates are anecdotal. There are 1,500 to 4,000 individuals living, which is what's listed on the IUCN Red List. But that is anecdotal. It has been 21 years since there's been an official survey on this species. OK, so you can see a drastic decline here. And then here's the anecdotal estimates. There we go. OK. So the Bahama swallow is most closely associated with pine forest because it will use pine snags to breed in. However, as I will discuss in great detail um, coming up, they will use other types of cavities. And so they can be found in other habitats. For example, this is a map showing um, the spatial distribution of known Bahama swallow nests in central Abaco. Now, this habitat ranges quite a bit from pine forest over here to coppice to mangrove, and it also includes several human settlements. So the distribution of the Bahama swallow needs to be assessed across all habitat types. Since the Bahama swallow breeds on three islands, the movement of individuals between those islands has implications for the genetic isolation of Bahama swallow populations. There are several um, possible patterns of, di of dispersal between the islands. Oh, okay. So the animation, okay. So the idea here is that there could be unlimited dispersal between the islands, right, with all three island populations functioning as one big population. There could be limited dispersal, but still some dispersal between the islands, or there could be virtually no dispersal between the islands with each island functioning as its own isolated population. I'm using several methods to assess the abundance, distribution, and dispersal of Bahama swallow populations. The first one is capture recapture, and I'm doing this using mist nets. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with mist nets, I'm going to give you a brief description. The idea is that you put a very thin net between two vertical poles, and you hope that whatever bird you're trying to catch will not see that net, run into it, and get tangled. Now, considering the Bahama swallow catches little tiny insects by maneuvering through the air, catching a Bahama swallow uh, with a mist net is not easy. Um, but with much trial and error, I have managed to uh, create a strategy, and I've, so far I've caught 158 Bahama swallows. Now, while I, while I have a bird in the hand, what I'm doing is um, I can sex and age it, at least within some margin of error. Um, we take measurements, and, um, and we place a unique metal band, which you can see in this picture, picture here, so that if we recapture a bird, we, we know who it is and where we caught it. I'm also conducting a couple different types of um, population surveys, one which involves driving along paved roadways and the other walking through pine forests. And this is um, using distance sampling. I'd be happy to discuss um, the specifics of that if you're interested. While we have the bird in the hand, we are also taking a small blood sample from each individual. These blood samples will be brought back to Virginia Tech and analyzed, um, and the genetic information contained within those samples can be used to assess the dispersal patterns between the three islands. Okay, so we've covered briefly the population biology, and now I want to discuss um, the phenology and reproductive success of the Bahama swallows, as in life history. So we would not know what we know today about the Bahama swallow if it weren't for the work of Mr. Paul Allen. Um, he conducted a study on Grand Bahama in 1995 um, during one breeding season, 
And it is because of this work that we know Bahama swallows breed from early April through mid-July, laying an average clutch of three eggs. This is actually his photo, so taken directly out of a snag. Um, but again, this study was over 20 years ago at this point, so um, there is a lack of life history. As I mentioned before, uh, Golo, or Golandrina Salas Americas, attempted to set up a nest box strategy on Abaco Island. These are actually uh, the nest boxes on Abaco, but since the swallows refused to use them, um, that, that means that I have to study them in other types of cavities. So at this point, I've determined that the Bahama swallow will primarily use four different types of cavities. First, they will use abandoned woodpecker cavities in pine snags and utility poles. And mysteriously, they won't, although they won't use uh, nest boxes, they will use other types of artificial cavities, such as cell phone towers and buildings. So that's still a mystery to me. I'd be happy to speculate with anyone about that. <laughs> To collect detailed breeding biology information, what we do is we monitor a subset of those nests, um, mostly in snags because they're ones that we can safely access. This is a photo of, um, of the specialized camera that we use. We call it a peeper camera. And um, so it's on an extendable pole, and the camera right, which you can see at the very top of these poles here, gets inserted into the cavity, and we can collect life history information, um, so we can, we can track ideally a nest from the time it's being built all the way until the nestlings are fledged from the nest, and um, we can determine how many eggs were laid, how many of those eggs hatched, and ultimately how many of those um, nestlings left the nest. Okay, so, so far we've discussed um, the biology of the Bahama swallow. Now the third part of this project focuses more on how the Bahama swallow interacts both with its habitat and with the other species in the system. And so um, I'm going to be investigating several agents of decline of the Bahama swallow populations. Knowing what I do about Tachycineta swallows and the Bahama swallow so far, I've decided to focus on three main areas um, of potential um, decline. Loss and degradation of breeding habitat, competition for nesting cavities, and depredation of nests. Now, as I mentioned before, um, without these pictures of the woodpeckers, um, these are the cavity types that the Bahama swallows will use. So they'll, they'll use um, woodpecker cavities in the utility poles and the snags, and then um, cell phone towers and buildings. Now, for now we're gonna move on um, from the artificial cavities and just discuss the utility poles and the, um, the snags because they need to be excavated by woodpeckers. And so their abundance and distribution isn't quite as predictable as it would be for these artificial cavities. To assess the um, abundance and distribution of these two types um, of cavities, we do uh, habitat surveys. They're systematic, they're randomly selected, um, which, and they involve um, assessing randomized plots in, in pine forest and then randomized transects along roadways. And within those um, surveys, we are assessing every single structure and every single cavity within that structure. There are several potential um, competitors within this system for, um, for nesting cavities. First, you've seen the West Indian woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker as cavity excavators, and so they are necessary for, um, for the breeding Bahama swallows. However, these species will also utilize, um, these, they will reuse these cavities, and so they are also potential uh, competitors. There's also a small raptor species, the American kestrel, Lasagra's flycatcher, and the invasive house sparrow. We can assess competition for nesting cavities by locating active nests of potential competitors. Here you can see a West Indian woodpecker nest with eggs in it, and a hairy woodpecker nest with nestlings in it. We can also um, record any occurrence where a an, a potential competitor is taking over a nesting cavity that previously had a Bahama swallow nest in it, and that is the case in these photos. Um, this is a West Indian woodpecker and a family of house sparrows that have both moved into cavities that previously had Bahama swallow nests in them. There are also several potential nest predators um, present on the islands. 
you have seen this guy several times at this point, um, but these woodpeckers are actually quite, quite aggressive and uh, can depredate nests. You have, again, a, a potential um, competitor for nests that also functions as a potential competitor or predator. Although I have no evidence at this point that the um, Bahama boa is depredating nests, they do have to be considered as a potential predator. There are also um, several invasive species that need to be considered, including the feral cat and um, rats, which are known to depredate nests. I can assess whether, um, so although I would really like to figure out which of these uh, species might actually be impacting the Bahama swallow, it's not within the capacity of this project to determine that. But what I can do is I can figure out whether depredation as a whole is a threat to the Bahama swallow. And so I can do that by using the data from the nest monitoring. So a nest would be considered depredated if it loses some or all of its eggs or nestlings. In this case, you can see that um, the, the nest has lost all three of its eggs. I can then compare those rates of nest depredation to the, um, the other species within the genus and get a sense of whether it has particularly high rates of nest depredation. So this was... Um, Sorry, we, I kind of threw this all at you at once. It was supposed to be animated, but um, the idea here is that there, um, this is a complex system where you have to consider who, which species are excavating cavities, in this case the West Indian woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker, which species are also utilizing those cavities. Along with the Bahama swallow, you have the kestrel, the Lasagras flycatcher, and the house sparrow and which cavity types these different species will use um, will determine how much competition the Bahama swallow has for those different cavity types. When you add on that both the kestrel and the West Indian woodpecker are potential predators, this adds another layer of complication to the system and it all needs to be taken into consideration when managing for the species. So the goal of this project is to um, provide the Stat, um, information on the status of the species, the life history of the species, and which factors could be contributing to decline in order to effectively conserve and manage the species. Now what form this will take is still not, um, not determined, but I've been working very closely with um, BNT and Friends of the Environment to do outreach activities, which as several people have said today is very important. Um, and there's also potential to do snag management and other forest management practices, um, but again, hopefully we'll come to a better conclusion as the work progresses. So there's many people I need to thank today um, for financial, um, logistical, and uh, moral support, um, including, of course, all of my funding sources. I want to um, say a special thank you to the BNT staff on Abaco Island. Um, I wouldn't be able to do it without them. Um, Katie Mills, David Knowles, and Marcus Davis. And uh, in here today, I think Tavonia's up there. Um, Tavonia Potts is a College of the Bahamas student, and um, she was one of my field assistants last year along with Nicole. She's actually agreed to come back and work with me again this year. So we're excited to get back out there. Thank you very much.